Welcome to a quick series where we run down and create the game mechanics that I've previously worked on. In this episode, we will be covering whirlpools. This whirlpool mechanic was heavily based on an article I read by a great shader artist, which I'll leave their link in the description below. This whirlpool mechanic will be divided in two, the shader and the script. So let's roll. Whirlpools have this particular circular fashion to them that can be replicated via the polar coordinate system. The system is basically a different way to visualize a point within a plane, whereas typically one moves along an x-axis and an y-axis to reach a given point, polar coordinates have a length and an angle to reach the same point. A game object, aka a mesh, is composed of points within a 3D space. These points, the vertices, hold valuable data within each one, like its position relative to the world, or a color for that point within the mesh, or a UV. Every mesh vertice has a UV, meaning they have a vector with an X and Y position. A texture takes this X and Y position and uses it to know where it should map itself within the mesh. If we were to make the X position of the UVs within each vertex, move from its current position to say 0.2 units towards the right, we would see the whole texture move along with it, since the texture projects itself based off this x and y value from the UV. We could remove this empty space from the left by making this texture repeatable. So now we know that UVs are basically coordinates for a texture to map itself within the mesh. Well, here's how we turn this same texture into a whirlpool. Something we intrinsically assumed was that the coordinate system for this UV was Cartesian, meaning X means left and right and Y means up and down. Yet we learned that X can mean length and Y can mean angle. So by converting our Cartesian coordinate vectors on our UVs into polar coordinate vectors, we get this specimen. So again, in this case, the X means length and Y means rotation, meaning that perhaps if the texture is repeatable, we could do something similar to the X movement in the Cartesian system, but instead move the Y rotation with the polar system. Something to note for the next feature is that after converting our Cartesian UVs to polar UVs, the X means length and the Y means angle. The wider it is, the higher their respective values. I guess you could say that polar coordinate systems are a bit racist. Don't, don't you dare. I'm sorry. And this preview we see represents a UV mapped to a texture where zero represents black and one represents white, which is a great moment to mention that UVs are values between zero and one. Anyways, something to notice is that the corners of our whirlpool texture should not contain the whirling effect since they are cropped by nature of the mesh, meaning we should need to mask this out. So we do this by taking the length texture of our polar UVs and raise each UV length to the power of two, which mathematically speaking will raise numbers like two and four to higher numbers, but decimals would actually be lowered. So the higher the exponent, the lower the decimals, while the number one represented by white stays the same. Yet multiplying this texture map by the whirlpool texture would make the values at the center of the whirlpool texture be zero. And again, one is white, zero is black. So if we add one to all values and then subtract the value they held before, we would get, for example, one minus the zeros of the center equals one and one minus the ones of the corners equal zero. So doing this math function would invert all of our UV values. And this is multiplicable by our texture. I hope multiplicable is a word. Now to recap, we've changed all the UV values within this mesh from a Cartesian to polar system. Then we mapped a texture to it, meaning that the texture will take the values from our UV and use those to position itself on the mesh. Then we added rotation to that UV by using the polar Y vector, AKA the angle. Then we masked it. And now we see a small issue, which is that there's still some values outside of zero within our mask. To solve this, we saturate the texture. Saturation simply clamps the values within it from zero to one. 
Next, we'd like to put makeup on our texture. That doesn't mean the texture isn't pretty except with makeup. We just like the texture to enjoy itself with different colors, you know? So we will be using a gradient, which is a range from one color to however many others you want. I used two. You might ask yourself, well, how does this gradient know which color to pick for our texture from its range of colors? And the answer is our old friend. We know that zero means black and one means white. Well, for our gradient friend, Zero means the leftmost color, and one means the rightmost color. And we've seen textures with a lot of different zeros and ones from a while ago. So by plugging any of these, we'd get different colored textures. Finally, after picking whatever texture style you like, there's a problem of combining it. If you did not do the genius play of the game of using our completed texture as input for the gradient, then you probably either made up your own black to white texture or took one from our previous textures. If so, then combining them would have to be additive instead of multiplicative, since multiplying anything with the zeros of our texture would simply return zero. Another cool thing you could do is that if you do not wish for the white values to be added on top of your gradient, you would always multiply these white values by some color. And because of what we explained before that the zeros will always remain zero in multiplication, we'd only be multiplying our color by the white and then add this to the gradient. Ironically, after explaining all this, I'm sticking with directly plugging our whirlpool texture to the gradient. I think that one looks cool, but you do you. With this final look, we can roll out to another feature, which is that the whirlpools are not flat. So let's structure our shader graph by separating the texture stuff with the upcoming positioning stuff. Since everything comes from the length of our radial coordinate, if we modify it, we modify the texture. So let's add a quick divide node to it, which will create this kind of zoom in and out behavior that is cropped by the mask and essentially shrinks or expands the whirlpool texture. We talked about vertices and how each one is a point within a plane that contains the UVs. Well, they also contain position information relative to the object space or the world space or camera view space, etc. You can access the position of each vertex the same way we access the UVs of each vertex. By splitting the vector, we could channel a specific axis and add or subtract to that value, then return it to the original squad. And we'd see how the vertices would all move along this axis. This might make you ask the question, well then could you take one of the zeros to one textures that came from the UVs and use them to manipulate the positions of say for example, the Y axis? Well yes. We can take the length vector of our polar UV, and by subtracting the vertices original Y by the length of each UV, we get this. Which makes sense because the center has values of 0, meaning it's not subtracting anything, but the corners have values of 1, subtracting 1 to the Y position of each corner vertice. And if we flip this with our old friend 1 minus, we get that drop. Anyways, now you're asking, dude, even though the corners are not zeros, the corner vertices have a small height increment. Well, that's because our texture does look like it has zero to one. But same as with the whirlpool texture issue we had, this is not the case, but is easily fixable by making it saturated, aka going from zero to one. And now we have that drop. Not just that, but we also have a cool scale value since everything comes from the polar coordinate we talked about. We can also modify by how much we'd like this steep drop by multiplying it accordingly. And the ones would be multiplied while the zeros would just do nothing. And we have the whirlpool visuals. Now, for the physics part, there are two ways about this. One, we could take the math we previously did in the shader and recreate it inside our script, having realistic case scenarios. Or two, we don't recreate the math we did in the shader, instead doing some new math to pull objects towards the center. I will do the second one. So first, we have to know what goes in and out of the whirlpool's range. This can be done with a trigger collider that will call back our on trigger whirlpool script functions if anything crosses through it. And we can store these accordingly in a list of rigid bodies so that every fixed update, if there are any objects inside our list, we can call a pull function for each of these objects. Since this script is attached to our whirlpool object, the center would then be its transform position that is excluding the Y axis. The direction our object will be pulled towards is the center of the whirlpool. Now is a good moment to point out that in my case for this video, I made the whirlpool transparent with an alpha blend. I also removed shadow casting from it and the surrounding planes. 
I also added this sailboat by Google and made a script that just moves it forward. We still need to address the Y position of our center. So for this, we subtract the center of the whirlpool by some value. And this value should be the drop multiplier we've created in the shader. So we can grab this value from the shader and use it for our script. Now, the subtraction of the whirlpool's center and the object is actually not just the direction from the object to the whirlpool, rather a vector between these two entities starting from the object and ending at the whirlpool. So we can get the distance by getting this resultant vectors as magnitude and the direction by making it a unit vector, aka normalizing it. Now, if the force is the actual resultant vector, aka the direction times the distance, our force is basically Poseidon's furious hand because the initial distance from the object to the center is fairly large. So our force's magnitude should not base its intensity on distance. Rather, the distance should be normalized and we can have another variable called pull that determines the actual intensity throughout this distance. For example, if the distance is a value of one, then the intensity is whatever value we want. If the distance is 0.5, then the intensity is half. Finally, if distance is zero, intensity is zero. How we normalize the distance to a number between 0 and 1 is by calculating the max distance and then dividing the actual distance to that max distance. In Unity, an object's a skill of 1 equals a distance of 10 units. Equally, a skill of 12 equals a distance of 120 units. So the distance of our whirlpool equals whatever the skill is on the x or z axis times 10. And we are assuming that the x, z plane is a square, aka equal lengths. So we normalize the distance, clamping it to make sure it's within our range, then assign some value as the actual intensity pool, combine these three amigos, and we got pull. And that rotation was added by replicating our force vector, aka using direction and distance. But the intensity of the rotation is based on another value. The last thing I did was destroy the game objects when they leave the trigger collider and are lower than the whirlpools' Y drop. The cool thing here is that you can add your own behaviors for this, for anything here actually. Alright, and now with everything done, we can sink some ships. If you are interested in creating or seeing this mechanic in more detail, consider checking out my code repository which is available in my GitHub profile with some additional nice tweaks. And if you enjoyed the video, genuinely, then press the like button and sub for more. Anyways, I'm signing out.